my record and get an education and a decent job. I'm thinking, talking about five years from now. I don't want to extend it any longer. I wish it could be less. But I don't want to rush it either. Because when you rush things, they don't go as they have to be. Maybe 10 years from now, because I like where I live and I wouldn't mind living in a mobile home. So you see the diff difference in aspirations, right? In his late 20s, Pedro's aspirations have been flattened and he's in survival mode. And so, so here, um, I've, I've talked with numerous students who have exited the school, who have gone through college, right? And two years, three years out, find themselves working in factories, working in restaurants. Some um, have connections enough so they, they tutor, um, but not getting what they hoped out of their education. And here's that said again. She said, the people working at those places, like the cooks and the cashiers, they're really young people, and I feel really old. Like, what am I doing there? If they're all like 16, 17 years old. The others are like senoras, who are like 35. They dropped out of school, but because they have little kids, they're still working at a restaurant. Thinking about that makes me feel so stupid. And like the factories too, because they ask me, just ask at the end of key, what are you doing here? You can speak English, you graduated from high school, you can work anywhere. A lot of the young people that I interviewed also heard these kinds of questions from their parents. What are you doing? What are you doing with yourself? Esperanza told me that when she fills out applications to work at restaurants and work in the factory, she leaves out her college degree. She feels that she could be a lot more competitive in a low-wage industry, not saying that she went to college. So another example of having to lie, by right? having to lie about this something that, that, that many of these young people hold so important, right? That college education. And so in conclusion, um, this population and, and this group of, of immigrants, and, and more particularly this group of undocumented immigrants, look very different, right? The ways in which their lives are patterned are very differently from those of their parents and other adult members of the community. And for them, this interaction uh, among contexts between legal, cultural, and developmental contexts really collide at around adolescence. And so for those um, interested in studying this population, interested in studying immigrant incorporation, really thinking about the con about context and the ways in which these contexts interact, right? And this is a really great example of that. The relationship between life stages and legal status, right? Is that being undocumented, right, what it means has to do with what it's matched up with. Right? And so if being undocumented means that you have no rights at all, it's a really, really tough existence. But if being undocumented means that you can go to school, you can participate in a number of community institutions, it looks a lot different, right? So really, context matters. And so also, the salience of stigma in these students' life is really critical. Like I said, in creating this secondary border that reinforces the exclusions, right? And so finally, the experience of illegality, of living in this narrowly constricted world uh, and in the shadows for a lot of these young people is a relearning and re retooling process. And so empirically, um, for these young people, and, and, and what I found is that delayed mo or blocked mobility uh, caused by a lack of legal status is leveling educational motivation, stressing parental child relationships, contradicting notions of small c citizenship and participation, and creating a new underclass. All very important empirical findings, but theoretically also, it's also rendering our measures, our traditional measures of intergenerational mobility by educational progress irrelevant, by, by breaking this assumed link between educational attainment and material and psychological outcomes after school. Right? And then finally, implications. And I want to talk about implications uh, on a number of levels. Within the public debate, the legalization has been front and center. 
right? And I think that this group of young people and, and this research really kind of underscores the importance of at least talking about them separately, right? And it really provides compelling, uh, com compelling argument for legalization for this particular group of people. But I want to disagree um, with the frame that's been used to promote this legalization. And, and what I want to disagree with specifically is that policy that has been used, the, the DREAM Act, right? And so the, the, the discourse around the DREAM Act is that this is a very small bill, very kind of narrowly tailored bill that will only affect a certain number of kids. It's a small number that we're talking about. And I can understand the, 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 the need and the policy need to, to frame this very, very kind of small package manner. Um, but my argument is that for those who are advocating for the DREAM Act, should be talking with folks with, who have been advocating for school reform for, for decades. So we legalize everyone tomorrow, and we still have some of the same chronic problems in our school. Talking about Latino students, there's still um, huge gaps in terms of educational attainment, right? And so how do those who are interested in passing legalization like the DREAM Act work together with folks who are interested in school reform. And then finally, and really finally, at the local level, um, schools uh, really, I really want to argue that schools work harder to improve the odds of getting more kids into college, right? For these young people, school is one of the legal institutions. They're the only legally permissible institution. Right? And so what happens um, if you don't get into school? Right? For communities, how do communities engage in the conversation? We have been almost 10 years on almost an exclusive legislation only strategy, but how do we do engage in the conversation at a community level whereby we talk about how to open up legal possibilities? Right? Working with local chambers of commerce, working with schools, working with not-for-profits, working with police districts, other community agencies to provide opportunities, internships, job training programs, uh, community service opportunities, to expand a menu of legally permissible pursuits. And then finally, adolescence is a, is a chaotic time for, for many young people. For these young people, as, uh, as this work has demonstrated, this transition to adolescence can be really, really, really volatile period. Um, how do we, uh, in our schools, work with teachers, work with adults and in, in not-for-profits in our communities to identify this as a very crucial period in the lives of our, our children and our community and to mobilize resources and support, counseling and other services around it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Please. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed hearing you. Um, I used one of your articles in a class that I taught here last semester um, about undocumented youth and uh, local mobilization. So it's great to see you speak. Thank and you. Tell my students are here. Um, and the question that I have for you, I just finished up my dissertation in the School of Education mm -hmm. about undocumented Latino youth and political consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the question that I have for you is um, sort of a question about the ethics of this kind of ethnography. Sure, um, absolutely. Maybe you can. You know, no, it's a, it's, that I've been struggling with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very fair question. Yeah, well, and, it, and I mean, specifically what I want to ask about is um, something that I've been struggling with is I came to a very similar conclusion that you did about sort of um, inclusion in the formal institutions of schooling, creating this particular kind of disconnect that young sure. people then have to sort of contend with after leaving either high school or college. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the question or the struggle that I have is in thinking about publishing and putting out my work sure. and that sort of thing, I worry about how that could be taken to bolster the argument um, that 
education for document the agency is very much under attack still and every day and maybe sure. 540 as well as the inclusion of children in elementary school sure what and just happened in georgia a couple of days ago absolutely, yeah. absolutely and so i feel like um something i really struggled with is this idea of hinging an argument on this idea that sure. you know, there's this inclusion that happens um, at the sort of compulsory educational level um, of grammar school and of high school, mm -hmm. which kind of creates this disconnect, which I think can be generative in certain ways, sure. like mobilization and other things that can be difficult as you um, elaborated here. But how do we make sure that that argument is not taken to a bulk of the argument mm -hmm. around, well, sure. that's why we should have supported these kids a long time ago. That's why mm -hmm. these kids should never be in schools in the first place, etc. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, I think that that's a fundamental question that, that many within the broader community struggle with. Mm -hmm. right? I was here, uh, the Warren Institute hosted a, a, a symposium a couple of years on the 25th anniversary of Pyro versus Doe. And Peter Roos was there. Um, Peter, who uh, litigated in Pyler, also in the TCAA and, and Prop 187, his 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 uh, his standpoint is we really shouldn't be doing academic research. He said it's such under attack that that people shouldn't be drawing attention to it. Michael Olivas, who um, who has done a lot of this work and, and, and wrote the legislation in or, or helped to write legislation in Texas for in-state tuition, also in New Mexico, and has also litigated against. Um, Kobash in Kansas and a lot of the attacks um, is of the mind or was of the mind that um, that we be, we should be doing more to extend Plyler, right? Um, and these are really good questions in a climate where if you've been paying attention over the last two months, anything could have happened. Right. Students really felt as though they were very close with the cloture vote on the defense bill, right? And then weeks later, um, 8540 is in court right now, right, as we speak, and Georgia, Georgia uh, is under attack, North Carolina is always in play, that has gone back and forth. Um, but you know, I'm really of the mind that there is very little academic research that is informing this particular debate. And the more of it that we can produce um, that presents a very, pre presents, a, that complicates, right? Complicates this picture, complicates what we know. Um, I think the better off the people will be to take these arguments um, and, and advocate, advocate for populations. But the truth is that a lot of the media coverage is really kind of stories. Stories are very important, but, uh, but a lack of analysis of what's going on from kind of pro and against. And I, I, I really think that it's a population that not a lot is known about and that the strategy really has been to um, so I talked about part of that, and the part is that it's a very narrow, narrow tailored group. The other part of the strategy has been to say, these are straight-A students, right? And the travesty is that we're denying straight-A students, right? Instead of making arguments that these students come from these kinds of high schools, right? Grow up under these kinds of circumstances, right? All of the mechanisms, right? Mechanisms are really what, uh, as social scientists, we really want to we really, really want our research to uncover, right? And hope that somebody then takes that to mobilize um, resources and policy around a more informed conversation. Some of the, the, the data that I have on gender, um, I split the sample in half by educational attainment, but also by gender, um, and. What I've identified as key mechanisms, this kind of perfect storm of conditions for, for those to, to be able to move to college. And, I, and, and Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who's coming in, in a week or two, in two weeks, talks about that a lot, these kinds of, this recipe for success, um, which, which is um, getting financial support to be able to go to school, to go to college, right? To be able to have a pass from parents, 
right, to, to not have to to work so much, not have to contribute financially to the family, um, and to have somebody to help guide through the system. For a lot of the girls, a lot of the young women in the study, um, um, 